Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Glenda Carpio. I'm a professor of English in African and African American Studies here at Harvard. And it is my great pleasure and honor to be here to introduce Professor Viet Nguyen, a prof university professor at USC, a renowned writer, and someone I had the fortune to have met in graduate school at UC Berkeley. We met in a seminar that he mentioned in his first lecture, a seminar on migration and borders and the literature they produce. Many of us in that seminar knew that Viet would for forge for himself a brilliant future. We all looked up to him. He was both cool and down to earth, erudite and incisive, a precise writer and a probing mind. We knew he would burn bright and how right we were. Professor Nguyen's many accolades include both a MacArthur and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's the author of the novel, The Sympathizer, a best-selling Pulitzer Prize winner, and the sequel, The Committed. He wrote a short story collection, The Refugees, the children's book, Chicken of the Sea, with his son Ellison, named after Ralph Ellison, and in nonfiction, among others, Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asia, Asian America, as well as Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam, and the Memory of War. And most recently, A Man of Two Faces, a memoir, a history, a memorial. Please note that the Harvard Bookstore is going to be hosting a book sale in the lobby for this book after this lecture. We're also fortunate to have with us an interlocutor, Leila Lalami, who is a distinguished professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. She is the author of five books, including The Moore's Account, which won the American Book Award, the Arab American Book Award, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. It was on the long list for the Booker Prize and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Her most recent novel, The Other Americans, was a national bestseller and a, and a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. Currently a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute, Lalami is working on The Dream Hotel, which is a novel set in the near future um, where there's no privacy. The novel follows a museum archivist who gets detained by a government, government agents after an algorithm determines that she is a potential criminal. Professor Lalame will be in conversation with Professor Nguyen immediately after the lecture. Allow me to say a little bit about the series of talks. Um, founded in 1925, the Charles Eliot Norton a professorship of poetry now biennially invites prominent artists, writers, and musicians to deliver a six-part lecture series about their craft. Professor Nguyen has named his series To Save and to Destroy on Writing as Another. Today, he will deliver the second lecture of his series, which is entitled On Speaking as Another. In his first lecture, which he delivered a little bit of over a month ago, in which was titled On the Double or Inauthenticity, Professor Nguyen told us that he is, quote, invested in the symbolic and economic values of otherness and how those values are created, extracted, and exploited. Referencing Toni Morrison's own Norton lectures, which were delivered here in 2016, he told us that, quote, otherness emerges from within the mysterious and unknown or partly known territory inside us all. It springs from the fears projected onto, quote, those we label strangers, foreigners, enemies, invaders, threats. Otherness is not inherent to any group, he asserted. It is imposed by the dominant culture. He then focused on what otherness means for writers who write about others and for writers who made themselves be others. The challenges or temptations, as he called them, for, the, for these writers is at least threefold. One is to treat the other in extreme ways, either by idealizing or sentimentalizing them or by victimizing or villainizing them. Many writers fall into this temptation, he argued, because they feel the political pressure to render socially acceptable ways of representing members of their own communities. This burden of representation, he said, quote, demands that writers tell idealized, sanitized, or stereotyped stories about their communities as they attempt to carry out salvation through stories, 
A second temptation exists for the writer, as other Professor Nguyen argued, and that is, quote, to separate oneself from the herd, to become less of a target by paradoxically becoming more visible, more individual. This separation from the herd is to internalize in oneself the already existing strategy of master and colonizer, to divide others and conquer them, subjugating the many and, reward, and rewarding the few. It is to search for power and mastery rather than truth. It is to forfeit what he called the full power of art. The third temptation is when the writer who is other gets something like a master of fine arts degree or some other certification and thinks, oh, I know this now. I know how to write. I know what the other is. But this is an illusion. Quote, otherness can be traded for money or otherness can be exploited for it from the enterprises of capitalism and colonialism to the work of art and culture. What are the alternatives? The, seri the series of lectures that he is delivering will allow us to explore this question thoroughly. In, and by way of closing, I'd like to note that one of the aspects of um, his, his first talk that I most enjoy was his candor and humor. He spoke openly about the literary market and how it shapes what and how we read and write in the humanities and how we might in turn shape the market to tell better stories. In that spirit, I'd like to shamelessly make a plug for a book of mine that is now just being published. Um, it's a book called Migrant Aesthetics, Contemporary Fiction, Global Migration and the Limits of Empathy. And I do so not merely to sell my, my goods, um, but because it uh, makes clear how much after all these years, Viet and I are still in the, kind of, in the kind of conversation we might have had in the seminar on migration and borders. In my book, I do argue against what he called in his last lecture, the sob story. The sob story that anyone who is considered an outsider is expected to write. Specifically, I argue against the acculturation story, which the migrant is expected to tell over and over again. What is it like to become an American? And I quote now Professor Nguyen from an article he wrote some time ago in the New York Times. So much of immigrant literature, despite bringing attention to the racial, cultural, and economic difficulties that migration face, also ultimately affirms an American dream that is sometimes lofty and aspirational, and at other times a mask for the structural inequalities of the settler colonial state. I quote these works in my book, where Professor Nguyen and I um, would have a rich discussion, I am sure, is in the fact that I think that the language with which we talk about domination, including the language of othering, may be too frightened um, with its overuse in academia for it to be effective. In my book, I argue that we need a new language with which to think about migration and other forms of domination, domination and injustice, and, and new genres, Two, so that the autobiographical injunction to tell one's story for the migrant, for the refugee, and so on, might be precisely what we need to reject right now. But as always, I'm more than happy to hear Professor Nguyen argue in whatever direction he wants to take us, even if it's in the direction opposite of mine. Please um, join me in welcoming Professor Nguyen to the podium. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Cambridge and Harvard. It's great to be back, especially to be introduced by my friend and you know former classmate, Glenda Carpio. Um, it's just amazing uh, that she is now, she just told me, the first woman who is chairing the English department at Harvard University. 
admittedly, it should have happened 50 years earlier, but here we are. And if anybody uh, can do the job, it's Glenda. We, we took a seminar that I still remember very vividly from Professor Hanara Padilla at Berkeley on borders and migrant crosser, uh, migrants and border crossings. De influenced me deeply as it, as it did her, I think, and our, our career trajectories have been parallel in terms of our passions and our concerns as teachers and as scholars and as writers. And so, so I'm just so delighted to be here sharing this moment with you. Um, and also, thank you for recapping the first lecture because I completely forgot what I, <laughs> what I had said. Okay, so now you're refreshed. Um, you know, in, in that previous lecture, one other thing is that I ended on the difference uh, between singular sorrow and capacious grief and how writers who are others are often expected to be attached only to their singular sorrow. That sorrow becomes the other's burden and the one thing the other can write about, at least to those with the power to let the other speak or be heard. In contrast, capacious grief allows the other to share their griefs and connect them with the griefs of others. In this lecture, I elaborate on these different kinds of grief, the singular and the capacious in relationship to my mother and what it means to have written a book, A Man of Two Faces, that is ostensibly a memoir about me that nevertheless features her very prominently. Ma was a hero who lived an epic life and survived an epic journey, only to be undone like so many other heroes by the only person who could defeat her herself. This was a purely private affair for her and her family until that is, I chose to write about her and speak on her behalf. Perhaps it's not true then that she was undone only by herself. Perhaps I too, in attempting to share my sorrow to engage in capacious grief have also undone her me and myself, writer and betrayer. In 2009, I published a short story called War Years, which is a somewhat autobiographical account about a boy growing up in San Jose, California in the 1970s and 1980s, with parents who owned a Vietnamese grocery store, which my parents called the Saigon Mai. I titled the story War Years because I couldn't separate that era of the grocery store from the shadow of America's war in Vietnam. In the story, I described my mother as she appeared to me in my childhood. Whenever she spoke in English, her voice took on a higher pitch, as if instead of coming from inside her, the language was outside, squeezing her by the throat. In retrospect, I wonder if it was in fact my language in my hands around Ma's neck making her speak. And if I was finding my voice as a writer, how much of it was due to speaking for others, beginning first of all with my mother, who was also my other. Unbeknownst to Ma, she was raising one of the most frightening creatures you can ever find in your house, a writer. I wrote and drew my first book when I was in the third grade in San Jose around 1980, not long after she and my father opened the Saigon Mai, perhaps the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose. My mother and father worked 12 to 14 hour days, seven days a week, almost every day of the year. As a result, I was very good at being alone, spending most of my time with books and stories rather than with people. My father thought that reading too much in dim light had led me to wearing glasses in the second grade, but if so, that reading had another effect. It fired my imagination where I could see perfectly. So when my third grade teacher told us to write and draw our own books, I was ready. My book was Lester 
the cat. Lester was an urban cat, stricken with ennui. <laughs> Bored with city life, he fled to the countryside. There, in a hay-strewn barn, he found love with a country cat. <laughs> Unexpectedly, the San Jose Public Library gave Lester the Cat a book award. It was my first taste of literary fame. I never thought of being a writer before Lester the Cat. And I'm forever grateful to the San Jose Public Library for encouraging me and setting me on the path to over 30 years of misery in trying to become a writer. My school librarian, a kindly white-haired woman, took me to the awards ceremony. There was a hotel across the street from the library, and she treated me to a hamburger at the hotel restaurant, which in my eight-year-old mind was the fanciest place I'd ever been. My family were refugees, and the only times we ever ate out were at a pho restaurant after Vietnamese language mass on Sundays. This was long before pho was fashionable. Decades before the celebrity chef Rachel Ray would offend all Vietnamese people with her pho pho. <laughs> Back then, the only people in this pho restaurant were Vietnamese, and the only language spoken was Vietnamese. We all ate pho, the ambidextrous Vietnamese way, chopsticks in one hand, spoon in the other, surrounded by the hubbub of Vietnamese voices. The pho restaurant was part of an international chain spread across the Vietnamese refugee diaspora. Years later, I heard rumors that the chain was funneling profits to the exiled remnants of the South Vietnamese army, intent on taking back Vietnam from the victorious Communists. San Jose was home to one of the largest populations of Vietnamese refugees in the world. And during our community celebrations like Det, Vietnamese veterans in camouflage uniforms guarded the gates. We sang the South Vietnamese national anthem. And in the exhibition hall of the Det Festival, I saw pictures of South Vietnamese guerrillas somewhere in a jungle training to invade Vietnam. My parents were anti-communists too, but they were more intent on saving our lives than fighting wars. Saving our lives meant working themselves to exhaustion at the Saigon Mui in pursuit of the American dream, which is why neither of my parents could take me to the library for my award, and which is perhaps why Lester the Cat had neither father nor mother. Now in this library, a massive white cube named after Martin Luther King Jr. I felt more at home than I did in my parents' home. We lived next to the entrance ramp to the 280 freeway in a house with iron bars on all the windows. When I was 16, a young white man followed my parents' home from the Saigon Mui, broke into our house, and aimed his gun in all our faces, a scene I describe in war years. When the gunman told us to get on our knees, I, the coward, silently obeyed, as did my father. Ba, like me, was very good at self-preservation, although Ba, unlike me, had been tested by history and forced to make life and death decisions before, like the time he and my mother chose to become refugees in 1954, fleeing from the north of Vietnam to the south. And the second time, in 1975, when they chose to flee Vietnam to come to the United States. These decisions, they told me often, saved us. On this summer evening in 1987, my mother surprised all of us by dashing past the gunman and running screaming into the street. When the gunman turned to follow Ma, Ba slammed the door shut on him locking him outside with Ma. <laughs> I saw her through the living room window, but I couldn't hear her voice as she ran past all the cars heading for the freeway, running to save our lives. <laughs> 
My bedroom window had a view of this freeway entrance ramp, and that night, as I watched a stream of cars ascend the ramp, I wondered where they were going and longed to go with them. The library offered me a way out. Inside the library was a world without borders for a refugee boy who had not chosen, unlike his parents, to cross borders. Books could deliver me across time and space, away from the house with its barred windows, away from the Saigon Mui. where Bama had been shot in their store on Christmas Eve. I was nine. My brother and I were home alone. I was watching cartoons. Seven years older, my brother took the phone call. When he told me, I kept watching cartoons. What's the matter with you? My brother said. He was crying. I was not. I kept watching cartoons. My father and mother returned to work at the Saigon Mui within a day or two. They had to live, and to live they had to work, and they only had flesh wounds. We never spoke of that incident again. So when my parents could not make it to my award ceremony, who was I to say anything? They were working to save our lives, and not just ours, but all the relatives back in a starving Vietnam, including my parents' parents and my adopted sister. Our hometown, Ban Mithuat, was the first one captured in the final invasion by the North in 1975. Ba was in Saigon. Ma, by herself, decided to flee with my brother and me and leave behind our adopted sister at age 16, by herself, to safeguard the family property, which the victorious communists confiscated anyway. I had no memory of my grandparents or this adopted sister, whom I last saw when I was four. Growing up in our San Jose house of barred windows, I was aware of absent presences, of ghosts, of missing persons, of the faces of my grandparents in black and white pictures gazing at me in silence. All these others, except my sister, died before I could return to Vietnam and hear their voices. Part of me longed to hear the voices of Vietnamese people, even as part of me didn't want to hear them. I had come to the United States at age four, fluent in Vietnamese, and all these decades later, my Vietnamese is still so fluent that when I go to Vietnam, people compliment me on how good my Vietnamese is for a Korean. <laughs> my monolingualism, my linguistic infantilism is one of the things that makes me an American. My resistance to Vietnamese came about because I grew up as an American and my poor parents, aware that they were raising an American alien in their household, sent me to Vietnamese Catholic Sunday school which was the quickest way to guarantee that I would never learn Vietnamese. And yet I yearned to hear the voices of Vietnamese people because as an American, I understood how Americans saw and heard or didn't hear Vietnamese people who were among the many others in the American imagination. I was an American, which meant that America's others were also mine. Born from what the poet William Carlos Williams called the orgy of blood that is American history. But I also became aware of myself as an other through watching almost all of Hollywood's Vietnam War movies, an exercise I recommend to no one, especially if you're Vietnamese. When Americans said Vietnam, they really meant the Vietnam War, but whether they meant the country or the war, Vietnam for Americans was an American drama, an American civil war, a conflict in the American soul in which we were the extras. This was our country, and this was our war. And yet our only place in American movies and stories was to be killed, raped, threatened, or rescued. All we could do was scream, cry, beg, threaten, or curse 
And if we could say anything at all, it was either me love you long time or thank you for being rescued. Of course, we were never so rude as to mention, at least in English, that we wouldn't have needed to be rescued by Americans if we hadn't been invaded by Americans in the first place. The situation in the library wasn't much better. The books about Vietnam were mostly about the war and therefore mostly about Americans. There was a well-intentioned children's book about a Vietnamese refugee, but I didn't recognize myself in its world of rice patties, water buffalo, and half-naked peasant boys. I finally found the novel Blue Dragon White Tiger by Jan Van Yitten, a diplomat writing about the war from a South Vietnamese point of view, and perhaps the first Vietnamese writer to write fiction in English. He said, I'm a Vietnamese by birth, an American by choice, and an echo of it must have stuck in my head. For decades later, I would write, I was born in Vietnam, but made in America. His novel put another thought in my head. We could write about our own experiences in English, which was an other tongue that took the place of my mother tongue. But almost all of my reading in the second home of the library was not about me or anyone who looked like me. Almost everything I read was by and about white people. And through those books and watching TV in the movies, which were also almost all about white people, I became an anthropologist of white people, knowing them far, far better than they knew me or people like me. One of the things I knew that white people expected of people like us, Vietnamese, refugees, others, was that we be grateful for our rescue by the United States. Perhaps I thought the best way to say thank you in English was to master English. As an adolescent in provincial San Jose, I became an Anglophile in love with Dickens and Austin, Byron and Shelley, Vanity Fair and Tom Brown's school days. And I'm happy to report that after spending 30 years as a graduate student and a professor in English departments, I have been cured of my Anglophilia. <laughs> but I didn't know any better at 17 and became an English major in college and then continued for a PhD in English for reading in English was the one thing I was good at. Even though Berkeley's English department disciplined me into the canon by having me read the whole of English literature, I hung on to this stubborn desire to hear Vietnamese voices and write Vietnamese stories. At the same time, I, I also struggled to find my voice. In my English graduate seminars and later as a professor in English department faculty meetings, I barely said a word feeling inauthentic, an imposter, a trespasser, an other. When I did speak, I wondered if I was speaking for myself or if I was speaking for an other. At home with my parents, I also barely said a word. I told my parents I was going to become a doctor. Really, they said. An English doctor, I said. Their faces fell. How could I explain to my parents that I loved reading Jane Austen and the Romantics, that I had discovered Asian American literature, which had saved me because it showed me that a writer could look like me and that I could look like a writer. How could I say that as a writer, I was still an other to many, even to myself, but I could also find a voice in literature to assert myself. This was impossible to explain because the language my parents and I shared, Vietnamese, was a stunted one because of me. And yet, as stunted as that language was, the language that I had mastered, English, gave me access to the entire world because its speakers had mastered the world through invasion, enslavement, colonialism, warfare, and capitalism. Still, 
I dedicated myself to this complicated tongue, an act inseparable from becoming an Asian American and a person of color, and someone who was just beginning to understand that he had been colonized and needed to decolonize himself. I read the literatures of peoples of color and anti-colonial struggle, and I took a nonfiction writing class with Maxine Hong Kingston, who admitted me to her seminar of 14 students. In that year of 1991, she was the author of The Woman Warrior, already a feminist and American literary classic reputed to be the most widely taught book on college campuses at the time. I was 19 years old, a self-styled political activist. Every day, I would sit down in seminar a few feet from Kingston, and every day, I would fall asleep. <laughs> she confirmed for me recently, to my face, that I was the worst student in her class. Whereas everyone else got an A, I got a B plus, <laughs> otherwise known as an Asian F. <laughs> she wrote me a letter in which she advised me to go seek counseling. I never did. Instead, I became a writer. Perhaps Kingston knew I was troubled because I wrote about my mother in her seminar. But I put those essays about Ma into a milk crate and put the milk crate into the closet of my adolescent bedroom. It would take me more than 30 years before I could muster the will to return to those words and to confront my awkward self and what it was that I refused to remember. During those three decades of misery, I did find my voice and become a writer. My first novel, The Sympathizer, was unexpectedly successful. I say unexpectedly because the novel was rejected by 13 out of 14 publishers. As one editor put it in his rejection, he just had too much trouble crawling all the way inside the voice. I understood why, especially given how I had spent a lifetime ever since my earliest days in the San Jose Public Library, crawling all the way inside the voices of so many white writers. When those white writers were writing, did they imagine that one day they would be speaking to a young Vietnamese refugee boy? Probably not. Was I nevertheless spoken to, even though they were other to me? Yes, because their voices were beautiful. And because I knew that if I wanted to survive in this country, I had to keep quiet and listen to these other voices, these masterful voices. One lesson I learned intuitively was that all those white writers I read and admired didn't need and shouldn't need to worry about whether a young Vietnamese refugee boy was ever going to read them. That's not their obligation. Therefore, the lesson I had to learn consciously was that I, a writer, who also happens to be a Vietnamese refugee writer and an Asian American writer, I didn't need to and shouldn't need to worry about whether non-Vietnamese people would read me. My obligation was not to care about whether anyone, white, black, or otherwise, could crawl into my voice. My obligation was to speak as if everyone could already understand what I said. That's an assumption a person of the so-called majority makes all the time, an assumption born from the privilege of being the beneficiary of imperialism, colonialism, racism, and patriarchy. It's an assumption that a person of a so-called minority may find hard to make. At least it was hard for me. To find my voice 
I stopped thinking of myself as a minority, even though I still sometimes find myself to be the only Asian in a room. But I'm not a minority. If I think of myself as being part of a world, a globe, where white people are the minority. I'm also not a minority if, when I write, I'm writing, first of all, to myself, because I contain multitudes. And I'm not a minority if I write to Vietnamese people. Everyone else can listen in. In The Sympathizer, I constructed a narrative in which the protagonist, a spy of French and Vietnamese ancestry, is confessing to his Vietnamese interrogator. If a Vietnamese person speaks to another Vietnamese person, there is no translation. If I were to write in the voice of our narrator, I would like a bowl of pho, comma, a delicious beef noodle soup, comma, then a sensitive reader would know that I am not talking to Vietnamese people. I would be translating for non-Vietnamese readers. People of the so-called majority, used to never translating themselves, used to always being translated to, might not notice this translation, this catering, this invitation to crawl inside the voice of the writer who has domesticated his otherness by turning himself into a translator. But imagine how you would feel if F. Scott Fitzgerald, in an early draft of The Great Gatsby, wrote, Daisy made me a sandwich, comma, two slices of bread, between which there is something delicious, comma. Fitzgerald wouldn't translate because he assumes his audience knows what a sandwich is or should know what a sandwich is. And that is the right stance to take. So, so-called minority writers do not translate. And readers of so-called minority literature do not expect or demand translation. Translation, at least within a book written by a so-called minority, is more often than not a deformation of a voice. The sign of the so-called minority accepting their subjugated status. For me, refusing to translate was crucial to denying subjugation and otherness, a challenge inextricable from finding and claiming my voice. Refusing to translate was also my way of refusing to be a representative of Vietnamese people. Too often, so-called minority writers are expected to be translators and representatives of their people, even when they're just writing fiction or poetry, a burden not usually placed on so-called majority writers. It wasn't a surprise then that a major book review of The Sympathizer called me a voice for the voiceless. And I thought, have you ever eaten at a Vietnamese restaurant? visited a Vietnamese home, hung out with Vietnamese people, were really, really loud. As Aaron Dottie Roy puts it, <clears throat> there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. What does it mean then for someone to find their voice when they are told that their voice is heard so much more clearly against the voicelessness of those others who are just like them. Those who want to hear a voice for the voiceless may actually be just as invested in not hearing the cacophony and the chorus of those they assume to be voiceless, those whom they have silenced those whom they refuse to hear. It's easier to listen just to the one voice. This is one reason why I reject the notion of the writer 
as only being a solitary artist whose task it is to find her or his or their voice. I mean, of course, much of the writer's work is solitary. During my 30 years of misery, I spent thousands of hours alone in my room, facing a screen and a blank wall, which is perhaps harder to do in sunny California than it is here. But always present with me were the voices of all those Vietnamese people I knew and all the Vietnamese people I had encountered in movies and books. Always there for me were the voices of the Asian American writers who had come before me beginning in the late 19th century who faced a level of incomprehension I can barely imagine. And always with me were the voices of all the Asian Americans and other people of color whose political and social movements had broached the walls of racism and indifference and given me the chance to speak and to be heard. I think of W.E.B. Du Bois's idea that black people always see themselves through their own eyes and those of others. I experienced that double consciousness too, to some degree. I was an American spying on my parents and a Vietnamese spying on Americans. But double consciousness is experienced not only through the gaze, but also through the voice. I may speak for myself and only for myself, but I am perceived as speaking for others, whether I like it or not, whether I want to or not. Instead of accepting this duality in which the so-called minority writer ventriloquizes the voiceless as their voice, I believe in two things. First, we all indeed have to find our own voices. But second, we must abolish the conditions of voicelessness. For Asian Americans, even claiming an individual voice is fraught. For our place in this country is to be the silent, acquiescent, apologetic model minority. We're neither expected to write nor to fight. We're not expected to speak alone, much less speak together. And yet, in the face of the anti-Asian violence that is perpetual in American society, routine in American warfare in Asia, and which resurged during the pandemic, finding and claiming both our individual and collective voices is crucial. And here, what's powerful about literature and storytelling, as always, as art and as weapons, is that they can teach us how our otherness has been used to divide us and isolate us, and how our otherness can be used to draw us together. Nevertheless, writing is for the most part a lonely act, where the otherness I have most often encountered is my own, and the otherness I have chosen not to think about is what exists within my own family. I think back to the opening lines of The Woman Warrior. You must not tell anyone, my mother said, what I am about to tell you. Kingston names the taboo and breaks it at the same time. In so doing, Kingston creates a parable of one of the writer's most important tasks, and that is to find what must not be told and tell it. But is this telling an act of honesty or betrayal? Sometimes telling the secret is both. Just as otherness and voice are both matters of the collective and the individual, so is the secret. There are two kinds of secrets, the private secret and the open secret. The lure of the memoir as genre is to reveal the secret, whatever it happens to be. But in the context of the United States, or perhaps any country, the readerly demand is usually for the private secret. Divorce, alienation, infidelity, mental illness, and the like. <laughs> 
like my mother's life and her death. Matters of the self and only the self, not the collective, are the typical drama for an American storytelling world that honors showing over telling, that sneezes when politics nudges too close into fiction, poetry, music, and television, that associates telling with the uncouth acts of writers who are barbarians, or even worse, communists. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with being either a barbarian or a communist, and I've been accused of being both. For me, a lack of politics is the politics of the dominant American literary world, leading many American writers to avoid certain open secrets. The open secret dares us to acknowledge its presence. The open secret of America is that white people founded it on genocide, slavery, war, and white supremacy. That orgy of blood born from colonization, which continues staining the self and the other. The open secret of America is that we do not call colonization by its name. Instead, we give colonization another more acceptable name, the American dream. The title of the story I wrote about Ma, War Years, refutes how Americans and perhaps people the world over usually understand the lives of immigrants and refugees, burdened by private secrets as they chase the American dream. Understanding that this American dream is actually the gold-plated brand name of American settler colonization, I understand mass private secrets as shaped by the open secrets of colonization and wartime, a time in which I also live, a time in which everyone who inhabits our war machine lives. In my mother's case and mind, I find it impossible to separate private secrets from open secrets, my speaking for myself and my speaking for an other who also includes my mother. A few years ago, after I had found one register of my voice in writing The Sympathizer, I reread the letter Kingston wrote me, as well as the essays I wrote for her. I had remembered that I had written about my mother and the time she was committed to the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. But I had remembered for decades writing about how that took place when I was a child. In rereading my essays for Kingston's class about my mother, I discovered what I had made myself forget, what I had kept secret from myself, that my mother was in the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward when I was a college freshman, the year before I wrote my essay in 1991. Back then, I wrote what my family, what my mother, would not have wanted me to say out loud, that someone out there, if not everyone, is trying to kill her. They crawl through the sewer and emerge through the toilet. She was waiting for them, locked in the bathroom, when my father decided enough was enough and knocked a hole in the door to reach her. It was my bathroom. Memory is odd because I still do not remember the hole in my bathroom door. Although I do remember the time my mother chased my father into the other bathroom, and when he locked himself inside, smashed holes into that door with a chair. My father, normally fastidious about every detail, never repaired that door. The gaping holes in the bathroom door revealed its hollowness for the rest of our years in that house. But if I can remember that damaged door, I possess no image of sitting with my mother in the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward. My only record of that time was what I wrote. She recognized me, but I was no more important in her world than the rest of the ugly furniture 
She looked ahead at the opposite wall. Her mouth remained slightly open, her eyes slightly glazed, but she didn't move. The experience was so disturbing that I had to forget almost every aspect of it, including when it happened and my reaction to it. I also have no memory of this. The tears started to come for me, and I got up before anybody saw me crying, because nobody had seen me cry since the sixth grade. I walked into the bathroom without saying anything to her, but I don't think she noticed anyway. I locked myself in the bathroom stall, and my first sob made me gasp. Ma recovered and left the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward some weeks later. But if the experience was so unsettling that I had to write about it, it was also so unnerving that I had to forget about it until my mother died two days before Christmas Eve in 2018. By then, she'd been ill for 13 years, ever since suffering a relapse around Christmas Eve in 2005 and returning to the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward for a second time. I did not take any notes the second time. I remember nothing of her second stay in the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward, even though I was 34. Or if I do remember, I have kept it secret from myself. If my mother was my first other, and she is also, as of now, my last other, not counting perhaps myself. Mao was born in 1937 as Nguyen Thi Bai, her first name a number, seven, indicating her birth order. Her rural family was poor, and naming girls with numbers was common. She hated her first name. And when she became a U.S. citizen, she changed it to Linda. She would not have wanted you to know that she barely had a grade school education. And that while I was reading The Sound and the Fury, she was reading the church newsletter slowly, out loud, with the aid of a magnifying glass. There was no other reading material in our house besides my school books and library books. But I tell you this secret, because even without much of an education, Ma became a wealthy woman in Vietnam, a self-made entrepreneur. She was determined to make something of herself, and when Vietnam was divided in 1954, when she was 17, she fled south with her family, including her mother and my father, her new husband. Then when the communists caught up with her in 1975, she fled again to the United States, leaving behind her mother and sisters and adopted daughter. Having lost everything again, she rebuilt her life and wealth again, Perhaps she didn't have time to read, sacrificing her time instead so that her son could read. Even as her son, reading deeper and deeper into English, turned him into an other to his mother. It took decades for me to understand what the costs of war were for my mother. Soon after we came to the United States as refugees, for example, my mother's mother died. I was four years old. I vaguely remember sitting on steps, perhaps at the back of the house with my father and brother. Something is being explained, but I do not understand it. This foreshadowing of what will come. One can see a foreshadow only from the future. What happened is that Ma had experienced her first breakdown and went to the hospital. My brother thinks the death of my mother's mother so far away in Vietnam, sent Ma into a downward spiral from which she eventually resurfaced, only to be plunged again and again. Ma came back, but I do not remember her return. She was simply present again, and for the next 16 years would be who she always was, loving and supportive, hardworking and sacrificial until she went to the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward when I was in college.
Was the cause of my mother's illness a private secret, something to be found only in her mind and body? Or was the cause an open secret, history itself, which hammered on her repeatedly until it fractured her? Or was the cause both a private secret and an open secret? Vietnamese people, how do you separate what is unique to you and your own personal trauma from war, colonization, the division and reunification of the country, from becoming a refugee or staying behind or being left behind, from being the child of refugees, soldiers, witnesses, survivors, from being the child of those who didn't survive. Vietnamese people, how do you separate yourself and your memories from history, your private secrets and open secrets, yourself from your otherness, your truth from your betrayal? One more truth, one more betrayal when it comes to Ma, is that as unique as she was to me, she was not unique to others. Thousands of people live lives as difficult, if not worse. Thousands live lives as courageous, if not more so. Understanding this does not diminish my mother in any way. If anything, I understand Ma better when I see her story against the backdrop of history. My mother, child of colonization and war. Me, grandchild of colonization and war. Also the child of Ba Ma, who chose each other. For all that Ma was lost to us for so many years, my father's love was not lost to her. I know, because the last words Ma says on her hospital bed in the family room before she says the Lord's Prayer with my father are for my father, to my father. Am yo an. This I will translate. Even if the translation is not enough. I love you. Then the Lord's Prayer. Then silence. My brother, the doctor, gives Ma morphine, while my sister-in-law, the doctor, watches. Ma's breathing slows. I lean close to tell Ma in Vietnamese that I love her. She lived a good life, a heroic life, a life that demanded so much strength, devotion, and love. I don't know where Ma found those qualities, but I am the beneficiary. Ma gives no sign of hearing. Her breathing finally stops. It is midnight. Her journey on this earth complete. When Ba asks me to close her eyes, I do so. Then he tells me to close her mouth. Her skin is already cold when I lift her jaw. And when I let it go, her mouth falls open again. Ma has been silenced, but her voice will remain with me. Her mouth is open, and I cannot close it. When I remember Ma, I hear her speak the mother tongue, which is also an other tongue, caressing me with the love and affection she bestowed on me throughout my childhood, giving me the confidence needed to portray her. And in the end, Betray her. Did she ever forbid me from telling her story? No. I doubt she ever thought I would. She trusted me, who cannot trust my own memory. From this forgetfulness and unreliability, and from mass journeys to the Asian Pacific Psychiatric Ward, where she was and was not herself, I have learned that the other is someone too close to us. <laughs>
so it is that my mother is mine, and my mother is also other to me, as she was an other to herself. As for me, a reluctant and unintentional memoirist, I've also learned that in telling on others, in speaking for others, the memoirist always tells upon himself as well. The other who is an other, even to himself. What I tell myself is that Ma loved me. Everything else I can forget. Thank you. Here with my friend and, and colleague Leila Lalami, uh, who I've known for quite a long time. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I thank you all for being here. It's always such a pleasure to share the stage with the award-winning writer of uh, Lester the Cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered if we might start with the end where you talk about being um, a reluctant and unintentional memoirist. And I guess I wonder what it is that drew you out of your reluctance and what, what gave you the intention to write the book now. That's a great question because um, in the middle of the book, I wondered, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, it, what threw me out, you know, I, I think that... Um, I'd spent years writing novels and excavating the depths of the characters that I was writing about and discovering that um, my characters surprised me. And you know this experience very well, I'm sure. And that the, my characters were surprising themselves. Um, so in The Sympathizer and its sequel, The Committed, it's uh, partly a novel, in the first case, the, the Sympathizer about a man who's trying to understand himself and he thinks he hits bottom. And then in the second novel, he, realized, he realizes he hasn't hit bottom. There's more beneath it. Um, that's great for fiction, right? But then, then in writing him, I realized that uh, I've, I, I also understood that I had to imbue him with emotions, emotions coming from me. And these emotions were coming from somewhere inside of me. And so that was where the memoir came from, this realization that in fact, what I was doing to my characters, torturing them, for example, was something that I would have to do for myself, interrogating myself as well. Mm -hmm. One of the th questions that also came up for me as I listened to you talk was actually something that you wrote about in Nothing Ever Dies, um, Vietnam and the Memory of War is the subtitle. Yeah, um, and You know which quote I'm going to, 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 <laughs> to mention because we've talked about it before, but basically the one where the line that goes, um, every war is fought twice. The first time on the battlefield, the second time on memory. And... In, in hearing you talk about the different kinds of memory in this talk, um, I've always thought about like this, what you mean about that in terms of, you know, public memory, meaning the way that we construct memory around um, historical events. So the, the sort of like building of history and then private memories, like the memories of, for example, survivors. But in this case, in hearing you talk about um, your mother, I wondered if there was, if you were expanding that notion a little bit in this memoir, because you're also talking about how that memory has affected not just your mother, but also you. So I don't know if, if, if would you apply a different label to that kind of memory, maybe a sort of hereditary memory or a kind of familial memory, a memory that is sort of passed down within the family? Absolutely. And, and I think there, you know, there's at least two kinds of memory. One is the memory that, that you seek out actively, you're trying to remember. And then there are the memories that seek you out. Out. And sometimes they're very banal memories, obviously. And then sometimes they're, they're lovely memories. And, and unfortunately, sometimes they're the traumatic memories. That's partly the definition of trauma. The memory yeah. that seeks you out will right. not leave you alone, whether you want it 
uh, want that memory or not. Yeah. And then there's at least one other kind of way that memory is transmitted, and that is through silence. So yeah. sometimes mem the family members will obviously transmit right. family stories very deliberately, right. stories which you, know, you should take with a little bit of skepticism, right? But then there, there are the unintentional memories that are transmitted through uh, the gaps, the absences, what people refuse to talk about. I've heard about this often from the children of American veterans mm -hmm. of wars, but also often from Southeast Asian Americans whose parents and grandparents were refugees. And for me, uh, this is one of the ways I understand that history lives within us. Because one of the ways that I think I experience history is that history ripples through me emotionally. Mm -hmm. That's how we know that, that history still mm -hmm. is messing with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I really resisted writing this book purely as a, an account of my mother and my family. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I, I do think that our private memories, um, even if we haven't been, set, been affected by war and colonization and things like that, but our private memories are often saturated with, with public memories, things that we don't even acknowledge. So that if you think about, you know, your private memories of JFK's assassination, for example, that's inseparable from the public memory that's been created, which for many people, they don't even remember. Is this what they've been told to remember? Mm -hmm. And so likewise, last example, you know, we talk about things like, oh, I remember World War II. I think most people in this room do not remember literally World War II. What you remember is the public memories that have been created about World War II. And so then when people start talking about how that affects them privately, that's a public memory yeah. that's affecting them. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of something that Baldwin wrote about, which is, I think the line is, um, history is trapped in us and we're trapped in history. So it's the same thing. Um, oh, I had a question also about um, language. So because you talk a lot about language in, in, in this lecture and your relationship to language and you, you essentially advise young writers do not translate and, and so on. And so I have two questions about language. One is about the writing of this book and one is about the sympathizer. So why don't we just start with the man of two faces in this book you use, um, so I guess this is more of a craft question in this book, you use the second person. Why that choice? Why not just tell it? <laughs> um, well, I think second person is really can potentially be, able to be very powerful. So I've, I've read some good sec first second person short stories and fiction and so on. But you know the the way that I found my voice for this particular book um, is that number one, I did not want again I did not want to write this memoir, and I thought well, I don't want to spend 200, 300 pages writing in the first person. I I I. And so the, the, the device that I used to initially leverage myself open um, was to pretend that I was the sympathizer writing about Viet Thanh Nguyen, which is him getting his revenge on me. And so that's why it's in the second person. It's me talking to myself, which is also the experience in the sympathizer. It's him talking to himself. Um, and, and so that was, that was the reason, you know, there's this duality in the book uh, between me and myself, just as there is a duality in the sympathizer as well. Yeah. Did when you when you were looking for, um, for example, you mentioned in your lecture, you went and found this crate, this old crate of essays. Um, did, did you have I'm just I guess I'm curious about sort of like the, the sort of archival research that you did into your own life. We were talking a little bit about this in, in the green room, but like the sort of letters and 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 essays that you wrote. What was that search like? And, and can you give us an example that's, that, that of something that really surprised you other than, than, than what you did? Well, I mean, I'd totally forgotten that the, that, uh, uh, Berkeley City Hall, I think, had sent me my own arrest records, for example. That was in my archives. You know, I was arrested for undergraduate <laughs> student protests. Um, I, 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 I also discovered, uh, papers that I turned into my professors and they're, they're, B plus grades and their comments on them, you know, and I realized, yeah, I was a jerk. You know, I was, like, <laughs> I was a jerk, you know. So uh, I remember I took a class with a with a famous uh, feminist uh, theorist and filmmaker, Chun Min Ha, and my final paper was criticizing her book, which I really don't advise anybody to do, but you yeah, know, um, but she gave me B plus. Uh, that's a common theme in my life at Berkeley. Uh, so yeah, there was all these interesting, um, some things I remembered, uh, but there, there are other things that I hadn't. So that's what an archive is, right? Because I think part of the point of what I was saying is that we deceive ourselves yeah. all the time. Our all memories the time. are very selective. Even as adults, it's not, ju it's not just kids who, who do this. And it's not just people with fading memories who do it. But memory is this active process. Yeah. So there is a function for the physical archive to give you some evidence of who you were at a certain time. Do you find yourself collecting your own archive right now to pass on to 
your future, your child, or maybe your children, or maybe your future biographer. <laughs> uh, that, 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 you know, I'm just a pack rat, so I do archive things mm-hmm. and everything, um, and everything's fine. But of course, the, the weird thing about my archive is that whenever, ask, whenever anybody asks me for something, I can't find it. Uh, so, I mean, I wrote, you know, I wrote a paper on Graham Greene as an undergraduate. And someone said, what, where's that thesis? I want to read it. And I, was, I would love to have that thesis. Yeah, too. I can't find yeah it. especially to compare with now and what you said about that. Exactly. About quite a but bit. the one thing I, I will not pass on to my kids probably are my diaries. Um, I talk about that in, in the memoir, you know, and I, they're not very extensive diaries, but they're very embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, maybe that would humanize me to my kids, but uh, I, I'm embarrassed by myself in reading those. So they're sitting on my shelf right behind me. And one day, I think I will, I will burn those. So that goes to how identity is very malleable, right? So right. We, we try to fashion it for, for others. Yeah. Um, so the question that was about language, that was about the, the sympathizer. So you were uh, telling people, t- telling writers, do not translate. Okay. But I wonder, I want to push a little bit on that and ask you, in the process of writing, So, for example, in The Sympathizer, we have Vietnamese characters. We are in a Vietnamese um, re-education camp. They are speaking Vietnamese to each other. You are writing the book in English. How does, in the moment of writing, does it come to you naturally to... Is it, do you rely on your intuition in sort of like including the, the words that are in Vietnamese or is it a more deliberate process? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, so part of the challenge in writing a novel like The Sympathizer was my realization that a lot of these people who are in Vietnam would eventually go to the United States and they would have to interact in English with uh, all the Americans. And of course, most of them are not fluent in in English. And so this is a real problem for those of us who are writing about people with other languages and so on. And so you see, you know, a lot of within the constraints of realist fiction, you see a lot of difficulties (laughs) as writers try to figure out how am I going to talk about people who are saying something in quote unquote broken English. Um, And I decided that I was going to go completely around that problem by writing this book as a first person monologue and confession and not using quotation marks. So everything is what we call indirect discourse. No one is saying anything in quotation marks. Everything's being filtered through our narrator. Right. So even when someone is saying something in English that is not grammatically correct, it appears so in his rendition of right. it, right? right? So that was one formal device, but I think the larger problem that you're pointing at is that these people are actually most of the time speaking in Vietnamese, right. but the book is in English, yeah. exactly. So, uh, well, you know, that is, as far as I can, can, can tell, uh, my own condition as a colonized writer. Um, and this is not a problem unique to me, right? So it's within that constraint, I have to write in English, as I talked about in the last lecture, the, the language of the colonizer. And uh, it's, not an act, it's not an act of translation in the sense that it's my own language. Um, and it's not an act of me translating Vietnamese for, for other people. It's an act of me getting people who read English to step into this world where the fictive pretense is that we are hearing Vietnamese, but we're going to hear it on these terms. And that's where the, 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 the structural device of Vietnamese speaking to Vietnamese is so crucial, because even if, it's, even if the Vietnamese is being implied to be translated, what is not being translated are the ideas. Mm-hmm. And I think for, for a lot of readers, it, the, the sympathizer in this book, too, is unsettling for them because they're not used to having untranslated concepts of how the other perceives Americans or the West or the imperialists yeah. given to them. Yeah, and, yeah, un- yeah. and hopefully I do that in, in yeah. as unfiltered of a way as I could. Yeah, I, I'm so relieved to hear you say this because I remember there was a, a review of the Morse account a few years ago where the critic was livid because there was one word that was that, that the critic couldn't find anywhere. How dare I use a word of Arabic measurement in, 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 a, 60, in a book that is about a 16th century uh, Arabic traveler. All right, I see that I'm running a little bit short on time. So there are people with microphones, uh, runners with microphones in the audience. And um, I can maybe ask you a question while people are getting their questions in order. Unless there's... It's very bright in here. Do I see a question? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, You said at one point in your talk that you started out as an Anglophile, but you were eventually cured of your Anglophilia. I was wondering if you could comment 
on why you were cured. Oh, cured of my anglophilia? Yeah. Are you an English professor? No. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, I think there are English professors and grad students out there right now. Um, yeah, 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 when I was an undergraduate, I was passionately an English major. And when I, was a, when I, when I applied to graduate school, I remember very vividly writing on my, my application essay that I believe literary criticism can change the world. Very naive, you know, but that's what, that was my passion. I, I went to the English department as an activist. I imagined myself as a literary activist after having been a campus activist. And uh, the English department, uh, you know, like every other English, like every other academic discipline, is about disciplining you and turning you into that person, the English professor. And, um, you know, after a few years of that and after becoming an assistant professor for, for a few years and experiencing the culture of an English department, uh, you know, you can read The Groves of Academe by Mary McCarthy, for example, any number of academic campus novels, most of which happen to be about English departments for some reason. Um, and so even though, you know, we're, we're a part of a humane tradition, supposedly, it's oftentimes quite inhumane in English departments in a variety of different ways. Um, so petty politics, uh, neuroses, uh, savage battles over inconsequential things, things like this. Um, but you know, the worst thing about it, I'm, 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 I hope I'm not offending anybody, but I think um, the worst thing about it, you know, was related to my talk, which is that I found after a decade as a grad student as, and as a professor that I had lost my voice. I had learned how to write as the English department and discipline wanted me to. I wrote a first book, uh, which I don't really recommend to anybody, but you know, uh, if you specialize in Asian American literature, it might help you. But you know, I found after I wrote that book that I never wanted to write another book like that again, because it was not my voice, it was the voice of English speaking through me. And so, um, you know, that, that was what helped cure me of my, my Anglophilia, that I realized, you know, in order to find my own voice, I would have to completely distance myself from the whole apparatus of English and its culture. It's not just an academic discipline, but as I talked about in the last lecture, it's an entire culture with its own customs and habits and, and haberdashery. I don't know what, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was increasingly hard for me to reconcile myself to being in the English department. Hello. Um, in your new book, you mentioned Wong Kar Wai quite a few times in the first few pages, and you have mentioned your familiarity with and disdain of Hollywood portrayals of war in Asia, and that you have taken a course with Ching Ling Ha. And I wonder if you could share a few thoughts about cinema in relation to literature and to your writing, and specifically if there are filmmakers who are working right now who you would consider kindred spirits whose work resonate with your own. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, the, 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 there's, a, there's a thematic in the book, like you said, about what if movies were made about the people, people like my parents. And of course, movies are, are not going to be made about people like my parents, at least not epic Hollywood movies. And so I say, you know, if anybody were ever to make a movie about my parents, it would probably be like an Asian American indie filmmaker with no budget. Um, which is not to decry that genre. It's a really necessary genre, but no one's paying attention to lives like this. Um, and so growing up, it was very, very clear to me that our lives were, uh, were being shaped very radically by, by Hollywood cinema. Um, and that Hollywood cinema, uh, is a very expensive art form. So for writers, you know, we write poetry, fiction, memoirs, and so on. All it costs us is our lives. And no one cares about our lives, you know. But a $200 million Hollywood blockbuster, people care about that. They care about that a lot. So, you know, not surprisingly, when it comes to things like the, the war in Vietnam and other kinds of political crises, it's the poets who respond first, I think, in the arts. And then it's probably the prose writers. And the very end is corporate Hollywood type cinema. Um, that, being so, that being said, I mean, part of the humbling reality of being a writer in LA or anywhere in America is that you could write a great book, you know, and you'd be lucky if you sold 50,000 copies. That's an enormous number. You can make a crappy television show or movie and millions of people will watch it. That's the reality. And so, uh, you know, in The Sympathizer, I satirize Hollywood filmmaking and then Hollywood is making a TV series out of the book. Well, I'm going to live The Sympathizer through this experience. But it's like 
living within capitalism. It's very hard to find purity in there. That being said, you asked me about the ideal director, and I, I feel like the ideal, the ideal director did in fact choose the sympathizer to work on it, which, which is uh, Pak Chan Wook, um, director of Old Boy and uh, Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid, the Handmaid, the Handmaid, I'm sorry. The Handmaid. And, uh, you know, if you've watched his Handmaid. movies, if you've seen The Old Boy, you know that it's a huge influence on the sympathizer. He just goes all out and he grapples with history and sexuality and violence and colonization. And he does it not just in the narrative, but at the level of form as well. So it's, I think it's very fortunate that, that uh, he and I have been matched together in the making of this, uh, of this book into a TV series. That being said, it's not my TV series. It's our TV series, or at best, his TV series. I think I remember, actually, when you, you were still talking to him. This was before the pandemic. I think when, when you guys were still discussing the, the mm -hmm. film rights, and now it's coming out soon, I think. April, yeah. Um, I think there's a question yes. over there. Thank you for the sympathizer. I wanted to do the victory dance after I read it because I was so energized by it or run a mile, even if I am over 70. Um, then I read it a second time and I asked, started to ask myself some questions. Um, were you tempted by self-censorship uh, about speaking about American history in Vietnam, CIA, sin of torture, etc. that it was kind of dangerous. Uh, if you look back to American history and the McCarthy era, where people had to leave the country for expressing themselves, even in a not very open way, about the American politics of, or government. Uh, that was my first question. The other qu comment I would have is, you are so lucky you didn't speak about that because you learned English at the age of four. And ha being a refugee myself and working with refugees uh, for 30 years, Croatian, Bosnian, Syrian, and so on, I see people destroyed by that, having to learn a language late in life, have to abandon their own profession, um, doing, uh, being uh, people with uh, doctors or uh, professors who are washing dishes in restaurants. So, okay, thank you. I, I do feel, I do feel very lucky. I mean, I, I feel like I, I arrived at the sweet spot in time for myself, you know, which is, as a for writer, you know, young enough to be screwed up by history, but not old enough to be really screwed up by history, as you uh, pointed out. Because I grew up in uh, the Vietnamese refugee community, witnessing all the things that you described among Vietnamese refugees of the older generation. You know, you come as you come older, it's harder to learn English, but you've been socially uh, demoted, professionally demoted. There was so much trauma in the community, in the older community. Um, there was so much. Uh, alcoholism and adultery and violence and all these other terrible things that were going on. And of course, we knew that it was connected to the war, but no one would ever say it. <laughs> you know? There was no such thing as therapy or counseling or anything like that. So everybody was left to deal with this trauma on their own. And of course, part of the trauma is the language issue, as you're saying, so that in the Vietnamese community, there's a very vigorous Vietnamese language press and media and you know, dealing with the history and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think people are very cognizant that it's not being heard outside of the Vietnamese refugee community because you can't say these things in Vietnam. And then no one in the United States who, you know, is fluent in English wants to hear what these Vietnamese people are saying in Vietnamese. And so then it's left up to my generation and the generation after me to talk about these stories. And like I, this whole point, the whole point of this talk is what right do we have to talk about these stories? And why do we get the benefit from telling these stories versus our parents or grandparents, who among them were among whom were many, many writers and artists and so on. So one last question. And hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, I was interested in you referring to sharing your mother's story as a betrayal. And I was wondering, did you consider 
sharing it as part of a, of a fiction book, kind of hiding that story inside that character? And would that have felt like less of a betrayal? And why did you choose not to do that? Well, I've written a short story about, about her uh, war years, which I quoted um, in, in the book, in, in, in the talk. And uh, yeah, there was an option to try to possibly expand that into a novel. Um, but, you know, I, I just wasn't interested in that. Um, I was part of the point of, of the man of two faces is as I, as I, uh, I think I quote Maxine on Kingston, you know, there are things that we want to tell, not just show. And fiction is at least American fiction is very good for showing things dramatically, maybe not so good about telling things. So I felt like I needed to find a voice and a form that would allow me not only to show my mother's story and the story of myself and other Vietnamese refugees and the story of, of the country, this country as I perceive it, but also to tell certain kinds of things, certain kinds of secrets or truths as I perceive them. And nonfiction works, for me, works better in that case. There's less room for the writer and the reader to hide behind the idea that this is fiction and that we can distance ourselves from what is going on. And so there is um, a, a dimension of nonfiction in which we are, we are forced to confront facts. Now, the facts can be interpreted and disputed in various ways, but there are facts. And that's part of what the book is about. The facts about my mother, the facts about myself, the facts about this country's history. What a great note to end on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all so Thank you, much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. So we want to thank the Harvard Bookstore, which is hosting the event tonight. And you can get Viet's book outside and, and get it signed. So we encourage you to check it out. And uh, thank you be, for being with us tonight. And we hope to see you at the next lecture, which will be on December 5th. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.